thing that started in and I thinking about this was the observation that viewing and we're going to talk primarily about improvised music, but much of what we have to say is translatable to other practices that have a strong, uh, art practices in particular, that have a strong improvisational bent. Imp improvising musicians, particularly those who self-identify under the rubric improviser or creative musician, these are terms that are, that are very commonly used these days, often view their practice, and perhaps the most essential feature of their practice is as being one of healing, both of self-healing and the healing of others. Um, they view improvisation as a means of healing, and this is an extremely ubiquitous language that you will find, um, and it manifests itself in the practices of many ensembles and individuals, in the titles of ensembles with names like In Order to Survive, um, if you're familiar with any of the discourses by, you know, great improvisers like John Coltrane and others who talk about the purposes of what they're doing, they often will talk about the healing. Yet, for all the ubiquity of this language, there's very little research, either qualitative or quantitative research, directed towards unpacking this language. Um, particularly when it's construed as acts of healing invol involving mental health. And we don't, at the moment, necessarily have a answer to the question, what is the healing power of improvisation? Because it seems before you can answer that question, you have to answer a kind of meta question, which is why has it been proven very difficult to unpack this? Why haven't people investigated it at all? What is it about improvisation per se, how it's understood, and crucially you want to say how it's misunderstood, right, that might not have people looking towards the improvisatory as a site for various uh, therapeutic practices? And what is it about the theory of mind that might make it look like there would not be in improvisatory practices the potential for certain kinds of therapies. Um, I was going to talk about an example that I witnessed, of one of many of the sort of healing potential of the improvisatory, but um, in keeping, I think, with these morning's presentations, I want to personalize it instead and talk about one I was a participant in. It actually was my first serious professional gig. I was asked to perform with a number of musicians who I had known because I collected their recordings, you know, and I was invited to this gig. I was extremely nervous. It was a free improvisation, but it was one centered in a kind of traditional harmonic setting. And uh, we started playing, and I was having, I was extremely nervous, and was having intonation issues, and I was having a lot of trouble finding this, the tonal center. This is a very difficult kind of improvisation, because on the one hand, there was no prior instructions at all, absolutely zero. You just sort of look at each other, and you start playing. But we were expected to be operating within a traditional Western harmonic framework. So it wasn't like, well, I could do anything at all, and it'll sound OK. And I was clearly off, and I was getting nervous, and I was getting even frightened a bit, and I actually was thinking things like, oh, I'm, this is it, I'm never going to perform again, and what am I doing here? And I noticed the bass player look at me, and he played a descending kind of little gesture. And the last note of the gesture found the tonic of where my tonal space was, which was not in any you know, traditional kind of uh, Western pitch. And at that point, everything sort of locked in, and the whole band decided to play where I was. And I, I literally felt this weight come off my shoulders, and I was able to relax. I was able to engage in the kind of improvisatory thinking which you need to do to actually engage in the moment there. And the gig ended, and the bass player came up to me with a big smile and said, that was really fun, Eric. I never played an F sharp and a half before. <laughs> and, um, which was about what it was. And in retrospect, I realized this was an extremely generous and a kind of therapeutic gesture. There are many other things they could have done. They could have played really clearly in what was supposed to be the tonic center and sort of said, over here, here's where you should be. They didn't do that. Right? 
And this was a sort of collective gesture by the ensemble, which may actually have saved my so-called career at that point <laughs> on. Um, and I, I, I've gone on to, to, to luckily perform with many of them again, probably still often in F sharp and a half. So what is it about improvisation that might suggest it ha it's a site for these kinds of therapeutic, um, I was going to talk about this one, but we'll talk about this particular performance actually tomorrow at the workshop. Uh, it's a performance where a Tuvian throat singer had a uh, extreme sort of sort of psychic breakdown during the performance, and her fellow musicians, in a sense, acted in real time in, in a way to, to heal this. That was quite quite interesting. Well. These are the features of improvisation that suggest why it might be an interesting site for various therapies. It's the real-time negotiation of the self and other, which of course makes it a good site for methods of articulating and exploring the boundary of self and other. It's the creation of bonds of trust between improvisers. Improvis improvising ensembles are sometimes called listening trusts among uh, theorists in improvisational studies. Um, and this, of course, makes it a good site for learning about trust, how to trust, how perhaps and when you should not trust. Improvisation is the mediation of important aspects of oneself via sonic codes. And of course, this suggests methods for effective and healthy social interaction and an alternative way of revealing yourself for those who might not be either comfortable or able to do so with non-sonic codes. There, may, there certainly are individuals who can perform their expressiveness and feeling much uh, to a greater degree than they can talk about it. Improvising ensembles involve the constant shifting of power dynamics, and therefore this suggests methods for navigating social positions of dominance and subservience. It's the negotiation and imposition of autonomy and will, both upon the group and then resolving yourself back into the group when someone else might take this sort of control. And this, of course, uh, makes it an important site for learning about uh, various social interactions, how to lead, how to follow, how to have concern for others, when to assert yourself, when it's not the right time. It's simultaneously the enactment and modification of one's intentionality. And this suggests improvisation might be an important site for responding to social contingencies and learning how to do so. And for all of these, improvisation l opens the possibility for doing these things, for experimenting, for learning about these, in a controlled and safe environment. It suggests families of therapeutic methods to explore all of these in a way that can actually be controlled. You can have improvising ensembles where there is greater and lesser degree of freedom. It's a mistake to sometimes think of improvisation as all or nothing. Improvisations are often rule bound in various ways, but the nature of the rules can themselves be modified in advance and crucially in the moment itself. Some of the most interesting improvisations, and I think here there's a sort of social and therapeutic um, moment to this, are ones where pre-agreed upon rules end up being jettisoned in a way that was not articulated as such in the improvisation, but clearly agreed upon by all. And often you can tell at the end that they've morphed into a different set of constraints. So if, if all this is true of the improvisatory, why is improvisation not often seen as uh, a potent site for, for therapies of various sorts? And we believe this is due to some still common falsehoods about improvisation. A story for another day would be how these falsehoods have a clearly racist uh, grounding in the history of theorizing about improvisatory arts, particularly in music, since jazz is often seen as the improvisatory musical art par excellence. Um, since um, African Americans and African diasporic people were often denied both intentionality, subjectivity, and autonomy. Obviously, there was reason to view their artistic practices as being incapable of being of expressions of these. And so, if that's the route you take, you end up with an extremely false, but still in some court is quite common, account of the improvisatory. 
So the impro improvisation is often thought to be random and aleatory as opposed to composed work when actually it's intentional and purposeful. It's often thought to be lacking meaning and content. How could it therefore be a medium or a vehicle for any sort of therapy if it's meaningless in effect? Actually, it's highly revealing of subjectivity and is highly dialogical. It's thought to be spontaneous, in that sense, thoughtless, when it's actually a product of practice and thoughtfulness. There is a pedagogy of improvisation. Um, it's often thought to lack planning or control, when actually it's revealing in real time the negotiation of various forms of planning and control. And if the following four are correct, which of course they're not, it would end up that improvisation is incapable of creating or grounding lasting interpersonal bonds because it's denuded of all content that can cons concern these bonds when actually we believe it's the creation of a listening trust. So one reason why the improvisatory has not been foregrounded in therapies is I think the residue of this false and ultimately racist conception of what improvisatory arts are about. And one, one, one way of revealing this, and this is not to claim that there's, there's a kind of racist agenda behind a Mount Sinai's music therapy program, but what's very interesting, they actually have the Louis Armstrong Department of Musical Therapy. I'd love to teach there. Um, and if you look at the therapeutic practices which they direct their attention towards, where is psychiatry seems to be an obvious omission here. And we wonder whether it's due partially to still operating with a false conception of the improvisatory. I have no, nothing, I do nothing creative. I am not creative. I have, uh, I'm here as an outsider. And I'm afraid my task is to do the rather boring thing of trying to pick up on one of the themes that Eric started with and develop one speculative answer to the question, where is psychiatry here? And uh, the theme, uh, as I say, Eric already mentioned, the theme has to do with intersubjectivity. So one thing that seems clear to us um, is that if a practice is going to have therapeutic applications, if it's going to be relevant to psychiatry, it's got to have something to do with the exchange between at least two individuals. It's got to do with intersubjectivity, whatever else is going on. And the study of intersubjectivity in psychology and in philosophy is known as the study of the theory of mind. So it's a rather unfortunate uh, name for this, but what the theory of mind refers to is the capacity that human beings have to make inferences, guesses, to be empathic about the beliefs, desires, feelings, moods, and so on of other people. Um, and uh, you know, you, you can see this not only in, in verbal exchanges, but you can do this in pictures, so it's perfectly clear. If I ask you, what's the man with his arms up thinking, you know right away. If I ask you, even if we're talking about non-human animals, right, if I ask you, what's the, the deer in front thinking, you know perfectly well what he's thinking. We have this capacity to do this even in very complex social situations. Now, uh, uh, sorry, and moreover, I should say, very importantly for this audience, uh, it's thought that uh, a deficit or impairment of theory of mind is at the heart of a number of uh, psychiatric disorders, most famously autism. Right? So those of you who know something about autism, or even if you don't, no doubt you've heard that the social deficits in autistic people may have something to do with the fact that they seem incapable of understanding in a spontaneous, natural way what their fellows are thinking. Right? So they're, uh, as Oliver Sacks put it, like anthropologists on Mars. They're trying to figure it out and they can't do it. Okay, so theory of mind is clearly uh, essential to our social interactions, may be essential to some psychiatric disorders. There are sort of two standard accounts in the, in the theoretical literature about what theory of mind is. In other words, theory of mind is just the name for a capacity. And the question is, how do we have this capacity? After all, I can't just read off what's going on in your mind, apparently. So how do I do it? Well, there's two standard accounts. One account is called the theory theory, very clever, uh, philosophical joke that never gets a laugh, right? Nonetheless, that's, that's what a philosophical joke is. The theory theory says, look, we all have theories of other people, right? The way we have, say, uh, folk physics or folk biology. So I know that a human being is of a certain kind of thing, 
And so in a certain situation, for example, here, I know that a human being is the type of thing that knows certain kinds of things about the social world, and when human beings feel things in their backs in certain contexts, they think, right? So I, I have a theory about what human beings are like, and if I want to know what someone's thinking, I say, well, what would a thing of that kind in this set of circumstances be thinking? And I run through a kind of reasoning process where I draw as an inference or I draw like a theorem of a mathematical theory, a claim about what this person is thinking in this context. That's the theory theory. Second theory is called the simulation theory. And this uh, says, no, we don't do this in this uh, uh, fashion of reasoning. What we do is we put ourselves in somebody else's shoes, right? So if I want to know what this guy is thinking, right, I don't apply a theory. I simply imagine myself in that situation. I think, what would I be thinking or feeling? And I assume, because other people are sufficient like me, that he will be thinking the same thing uh, that I am. Now, without going, I, I've given you a very, very quick, uh, as you might imagine, cartoon of these two theories. And there's lots of questions they raise. But I think one thing that I want to say about this, and I think Eric and I, this is one of the places we came together on this, uh, on this question, is that um, both of these accounts of theory of mind are what we call cognitively laborious, right? They're very demanding. So the, the, both of these methods posit a very cognitively demanding process, okay? You have to work hard. It's not to say you can't do it fast, but you have to work hard. You have to, have to reason, or you have to engage demandively. There's lots of stuff that has to happen. Uh, and I put this picture up there because this captures a kind of extreme version of what I think the theory theory and simulation theory are out to explain. You know, the kind of thing that we clearly do, right, when you're trying to imagine what someone's thinking, and it takes work, right? I mean, here's a tough decision. It takes work. It's the kind of thing, you know, we do, oh, should I go to Harvard or should I go to Princeton? Well, we take an envelope, we start writing things down. That's the kind of thing that, go, that, that uh, these accounts have in mind, okay? Now, so this picks up on, on, on this, right? If you were to think that improvisation has these features, then of course you're not going to think that uh, improvisation is a place where you're going to understand somebody else's mind, because there, somebody else's mind is not present, as it were, right? Somebody else is just playing the keys. So as a first pass, theory of mind is not even relevant uh, to improvisation on that mistaken account of improvisation. But even if you don't have that account of improvisation, it's clear that improvisation doesn't fit with theory of mind on traditional conception, because improvisation is something that happens spontaneously, fast, in interaction with others, by watching their bodies, by watching their faces, by watching their body language, right? You can imagine that someone, even with a fairly sophisticated view of jazz, improvisation more generally, would think, look, Whatever's going on here, you can't be understanding somebody else's mind. You can't be engaging in this intersubjective process because, jazz, I mean, to put it bluntly, it just happens too fast, right? It's not, it's not like that. Okay, so our speculative answer, just to hit the bottom line, is that even if you have a fairly sophisticated account of what improvisation is, it looks like it just passes in the night with the standard account of how we understand each other's minds as it's pursued in psychiatry. Yeah, that's, that's our speculative answer. Um, now, fortunately, the story doesn't end there because we don't think that this is, just as we don't think the standard story about improvisation is correct, we don't think the standard story about theory of mind is correct either. And the reason is very simple. Uh, these are, again, cartoons. But what the cartoons suggest is that we understand each other to a large extent in ordinary interactions, not by thinking hard about what someone's like or putting them ourselves in their shoes and so on. We know exactly what these people are thinking just by looking at their faces and their body language, right? We just read it off. And a number of theorists, not a large number, but a good number, and, and which is a good in the sense of a number of good people, have begun to suggest that maybe theory of mind at least in some circumstances, is more like this automatic reading, uh, reading off than it is like this cognitively laborious process. So the most famous advocate of this view is, is Sean Gallagher, very distinguished philosopher, who develops a view that he calls the interactionist view, which is exactly that. It says, look, often, it's not that we don't think about hard cases where someone is trying to decide between the bear and the cliff. We do, and it takes us work. 
But in ordinary interactions, much of what we do is just engage interactively with the embodied presence of the other. Now, this is very nice, of course, because you can see where I'm going to go with this. If that's right, then suddenly improvisation uh, enters again into the realm of possibility. Um, I'll just show you, uh, th there are, as I say, a number of people who've been looking at this, uh, this form of theory of mind uh, experimentally, and it's something that, that we're doing in my lab. Um, and I'll just show you some, some evidence that there is such a theory of mind, okay? This is a picture that uh, comes from a standard exploration of theory of mind. It was developed by Simon Baron Cohen, very famous autism researcher. And what you have to do in this task is you look at the eyes and you have to pick the right word that seems to capture the state of mind of the person who you're looking at. And what this uh, normally, uh, we, we do this normally uh, in an open setting. You sort of look at the thing and you can take as long as you like and you pick the appropriate the appropriate term, and indeed this, this is used very widely, and it does seem to show that people with autism are less good at this form of theory of mind. So it does, it does capture this intuition that, or this hypothesis that theory of mind and autism are related. So if you pick panic, you are neurologically normal. Um, now, this is a very demanding, <laughs> very demanding task, okay? As you can imagine, it's a very demanding task because as you'll see in a second, the pictures are all different, the people are all different, the color, the, the gray levels are different. You're only seeing the eyes after all, this is tough, and the words are, are very demanding, right? They're semantically, they're semantically demanding. Um, but actually, we had a hypothesis that uh, you could do this very, very easily. So let me show you how. H have a look at the fixation cross there. I'm gonna show you another picture just like that from the same series very, very quickly, okay? And then I'm gonna give you the words and I want you to pick the right word. You ready? Here we go. Okay. Who says terrified, upset, arrogant, annoyed? Oh, no one's voting. You're like my undergraduates. No one wants, he might, he might take away, take off marks if I get it wrong. Yeah, exactly. Well, the answer is upset. See, you undermine the effectiveness of my talk by refusing to answer, right? Because when I get people to answer, people get it right, okay? Well, anyhow, I stipulate you would have got it right. Um, but I'll show you some data in a sec. Now, you might think, well, uh, what happens when you see the image very fast is you have a, an iconic memory of it that, that lasts for a little while. So maybe you're not really perceiving it fast and then doing the, the theory of mind. Maybe you're looking at your iconic image, your memory of it, over a longer period. So it's not really that different from the original version, right? So what we did was we created what's called a mask, uh, just something that, will, that comes right after the original image, and this is something used in psychophysics very commonly. A mask obscures, from the point of view of memory, the original image, and if you put a mask that's very similar to the original image, it, it utterly obliterates it. So this is the most demanding sort of mask you could, you could have. So what you're going to see is another version of this where you see the image, you'll see this mask, and then you'll see the words, okay? Stick your neck out. We're all, you're a bunch of psychiatrists, right? Aren't you supposed to be, I don't know, be vulnerable, right? You can be vulnerable to me. Okay, here we go. Let's try it again. Take a guess, just for fun, okay? Take a guess. Playful. Oh, God bless you. Okay, right? You see? Okay. Um, now, so the image went by very fast. The mask you hardly saw and yet you did it, um, you did it very quickly. Now, we, we, so we did, the, did this as a proper experiment. Um, if you're just guessing, you're 25% correct, right? Because there's four words. And uh, even at 12, the 12.5 12 that refers to milliseconds, 12.5 thousandths of a second, okay? You can do this better than chance. And as you get up to 400 milliseconds, not even half a second, you're doing it very, very well. Uh, if you give people all the time in the world, they only get it 80% correct, okay? So with, without the mask, you're, at, you're, you're nearly at, at the maximum uh, there, so that's inf infinity. But at 400 seconds, even, 400 milliseconds rather, even with a mask, right, you're very close to as, uh, as good as anybody does. Now to me, that, that, that shows that there's a system that's happening automatically, fast, spontaneous. You don't have to turn it on, you don't have to do anything. It's not laborious at all, okay? So there's a tiny bit of evidence that there is a system that underlies all of these activities that clearly do involve 
an intersubjective exchange, that can't possibly, for all sorts of reasons, involve the kind of laborious processes that most theorists believe are involved. And that includes, of course, improvisation. So we think that there really are two theory of mind capacities. We use both of them in different circumstances. But that fortunately, because there is this fast, spontaneous, embodied, inactive theory of mind, we could use it to, to study improvisation. And we think that uh, there is a place for the study of improvisation as a site for intersubjective interaction, and therefore as a site for possible therapy. And uh, what we're going to do tomorrow, I guess, is invite people to tell us what they think the possibilities are, because we're really, Eric and I are just at the very beginning of this, and we're really trying to make a case for you in, in a way for ourselves that this is worth exploring. Of course, we haven't yet explored it, uh, but this is something that we want to do. Thank you very much. <laughs>